I don't quite know why you find it shocking. I mean, of course, we all pay lip service to the idea that progress is good and we should be changing all the time, but what if we're right? And so um, it, do it doesn't necessarily follow that, uh, that w what people thought in the 1960s and 70s is still largely believed is a bad thing. Maybe it is actually right. Well, I think this is a, a very interesting perspective, and it's one that I held to. Uh, when I was in college, I was a student of Robert Trivers, who's a contemporary of, of Richard's. Um, and as his student, I looked at the landscape of questions, and I felt it wasn't resentment, but I felt some sadness that it looked like Richard and Bob's generation had run the table and they had solved all of the big issues in evolutionary biology and that they had left only small issues for us. And over time I came to realize that that wasn't the case, that there were major issues left unsettled that we had stopped talking about because there was no progress. And so um, I, I took up looking at those issues and saying, what is it that we have wrong that has caused us to stop making progress on questions like why do females in many species require males to, to engage in elaborate displays uh, before mating with them? That question is still not answered. There are plenty of ideas on the table, but as for one that we all agree on, nothing has emerged. Why are there more species when you get closer to the equator and fewer species as you move towards the poles? Why do we grow feeble and inefficient with age? These are all questions on which some progress had been made, but that progress seemed to me to have stagnated. So I don't disagree with you that your generation got an awful lot right, but what I wonder about is why progress has slowed given the number of large questions that remain, and a related question is why there does not seem to be a generation of biologists that followed you that appear to be working in a way that would allow them to solve big questions in the way that R.A. Fisher had, or you did, or Bob Trivers did. I don't see that generation of biologists that are capable of wielding tools in the bold way that, that you all managed. I think then the onus is on you. Let, I mean, let's talk about a particular example, like say the, se the sexual selection one you raised, um, and say, what is it that you think uh, hasn't been... Well, obviously, you're right, it's still going on, and there's much controversy going on. It's a very flourishing field. There are lots of people working in the field, uh, doing work in the, in the, out in, in the field on sexual selection. There are two major strands of theory of sexual selection. Um, perhaps you could just trace them to Fisher on the one hand, and, well, Wallace, um, De Harvey, um, Hamilton on the other. And they're both um, very interesting theories. They both they they probably might might both work. I mean, what what's wrong with that? Uh, uh. It's a great question. Um, here's what's wrong with it. So okay. what what Richard is referring to, uh, and I believe both you and I would come out on the Hamilton side of this argument, and we would both I would imagine be advocates for a good genes. Well, no, I mean I, I I would be. Do we need to explain what this is? I mean, yeah, yeah. maybe. Yeah, um, uh, Darwin noticed that uh, many biological characteristics, and animal characteristics of males especially, are apparently advertising to females. Peacock's tails, um, gorgeous feathers, beautiful fish, that kind of thing. And Darwin was content simply to say, that's what females like. It's an aesthetic thing, a matter of female whim. And so in order for a male to reproduce successfully and pass on his genes, he has to be attractive, and therefore genes for being attractive get passed on to the next generation because females choose them. Wallace, the co-discoverer of natural selection, hated that idea. Uh, Wallace was more of a utilitarian and believed that um, beautiful characteristics like peacock's tails had to be useful. Uh, it wasn't enough just to simply say, females love them. You had to say this is somehow an advertisement for a good male, a male who's going to be a good father or a good, provide good genes. Wallace wouldn't have used that phraseology, of course. And that divide between Darwin and Wallace has persisted from the 19th century through the 20th century. Um, Wallace felt that to invoke uh, female taste 
was bordering on mysticism. Uh, and Darwin's idea there was rescued in the 1920s and 30s by R.A. Fisher, the, one of the great founders of modern population genetics. And R.A. Fisher made the, da the Darwin theory respectable by allowing female choice to be under genetic control just as much as male anatomy, male tails, etc., are under, uh, are under genetic control. And Fisher produced uh, a, a model which must have been a mathematical model, although he didn't lay it out in mathematical terms. It must have been there, in which natural selection simultaneously works on genes in males for being beautiful and genes in females for liking beauty. And when you realize that both baby males and baby females inherit the genes from their father for being beautiful and the genes from their mother for liking beauty, those two go together and can produce something like a peacock's tail. That was the Fisher theory which has been brought up to date by modern mathematical biologists. But the Wallace strand of theory, uh, which Brett favors and, and to some extent so, so do I, um, agrees with Wallace that beauty has to be useful and adopts the idea that what a female is doing when she, when she is beautiful is advertising to males that she, sorry, what a male is doing when advertising to females is advertising to females, for example, that he's healthy, that he's strong. In the extreme version of the theory due to Amos Zahavi, a male is, is advertising that he has He's such a, a good, fit male that he's capable of surviving in spite of having this ridiculous tail, um, which should have killed him because it's vulnerable to predators, you can't fly very well with it, and so on. Um, and less extreme versions of that theory are attributable to W.D. Hamilton, who thought that um, uh, health was the primary virtue which a male is advertising to females, and a beautiful tail is an advertisement to a female, this is a healthy male. He's not suffering from parasites, he's resistant to, pa to parasites. Otherwise, he wouldn't have this beautiful, glowing, sexy tail. So, um, uh, that was just an interruption because we were talking about um, the, 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 the Zahavi Hamilton type theory which Brett favors, I'm sorry, okay. So no, that's perfect. Yeah. Um, and it actually shows exactly the point that I was trying to make, which is that you've now heard a lot. There's plenty of good work um, that suggests that this could be handicap um, that would demonstrate uh, the, the genes have to be heritable in order for females to be favored to be selecting for them. But the problem is that there is a rotten piece of this theory right at the heart which is that females are choosing to inflict this burden on their male offspring, which is ecologically certain to be costly to them. So if females are attempting to find good genes by putting males through a test, then they are inflicting bad genes on their male offspring. Those bad genes will be transmitted by their female offspring, but not expressed, so the females will not suffer the cost of that handicap, but there's a question of how it is that females recover enough of a benefit for their female offspring to justify the costs for the male offspring. So there's a way in which, although one can make a mathematically compelling argument for a handicap idea or, or a good genes idea, um, that it has to account for a very large benefit for female offspring, and what's worse if you imagine a species, like let's say we're talking about peacocks. Peacocks, the female, the peahen, inflicts this marvelous tail on her male offspring by choosing fathers that have it in peacocks, like all creatures that have these elaborate displays. Males contribute nothing other than genes, so if she's picking something valuable, it has to be encoded in the genes. Um, so she inflicts this cost on her male offspring and presumably then acquires a benefit for her female offspring. But they do this each and every generation. Only a small number of males in each generation mate. Females choosing these tails pick the same males again and again. So that ought to leave the number of bad genes in the environment very small because females are eliminating those bad genes each and every generation, which means 
that after a small number of generations, there ought to be very little advantage in picking males with beautiful tails because there are no bad genes left. And so the question is, if one of these good genes hypotheses is correct, why is female vigilance constant? It should be females select against bad genes, the number of bad genes drops, female vigilance now has no value, female vigilance should drop, bad genes should crop back up, female vigilance should rise again, and we should see an oscillating pattern. But we don't see it. What we see is generation after generation, females choose the males with the most elaborate tails. So it doesn't matter what the answer is here. The point is, this is a question that year after year remains with us, and we make no progress on it. We are still fumbling with explanations that have one value, but don't completely answer the question. So why is that? But this is a matter for mathematical modeling, and it's being done. And there are various different mathematical models, which um, we can't go into now. But, but, but I mean, th this is something that is an active field of theoretical research, well, and it's going on. Um, I must say, I have become something of a skeptic of mathematical modeling, because it suffers from two kinds of errors that are pretty obvious. One is it will sometimes give you an answer that is not viable in reality. In other words, if we were to mathematically model the way a sphere sits on a razor, as long as there are no other forces input into this system, we will be told that a sphere will balance on a razor. But we all know that a sphere doesn't balance on a razor. Right? Mathematical modeling will tell you that uh, a cup of coffee in a room will take an infinite amount of time to equalize, that it will approach the temperature of the room, and the room will approach the temperature of the coffee, but they will never reach each other. We know that this isn't the case. So mathematical modeling has a way in which it can fool us into thinking that we have the right answer when we don't. And the other problem is that these mathematical models very frequently have so many parameters in them that you can match any natural behavior, even if the model isn't the reason that the natural behavior is what it is. So um, I am... I'm a little actually surprised to hear you defend... Yeah, but, the, the, but the remedy for that is better mathematical models. It's not throwing out mathematical models altogether. And, well, and I don't know. I, I had a, uh, a mentor um, in graduate school um, who was himself a mathematician, and he said something striking to me one day. He said that um, math is the language we resort to when we don't know how to explain something. And so... I would argue, yes, mathematical models can reinforce an explanation that is itself sensible, but if we don't have an explanation that's actually satisfying, the fact that we have a mathematical model that suggests it, I don't find especially compelling. Because there are lots of ways you can get there. Well, to, to go back to what you first started saying about the, uh, the difficulty with the Zahavi theory that the... That the the, f the female inflicts on the way you, you, you put it was right. The female in, inflicts upon her, her offspring the, 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 the handicap as well as the, as the benefit. I mean, that's exactly what I said in The Selfish Gene when I ridiculed the Zahavi theory. And mm -hmm. I was wrong. Because my student, uh, Alan Graffin, who's now a fellow professor at, at Oxford, did produce a mathematical model which does show that, as a matter of fact, the Zahavi theory can work. And we were, we were, I was wrong, everybody else was wrong. And, and Gra Graffin showed that, that we were wrong by producing a mathematical model which shows that the, that the, the Zahavi handicap theory can work. Um, and uh, I, not being a mathematician myself, have to bow to that. I understand the model and I think, I think it works. I think it's a, it's a very good one. And I et humble pie. I, I said I was, I was wrong, and, and my student Alan Graffin was right. Well, but I think, I think you are too hasty to accept that you were wrong. And in fact, I, I'm not certain of this. It's been a while since I have read it. But if I'm correct, what you said about Zahavi in The Selfish Gene was that this didn't, am I right, that you said it didn't sound like the way natural selection works? I think I was a bit ruder about it than that. <laughs> That's likely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm not quite sure what, I mean, wh how could you p possibly argue the case without, I mean, there, there are some cases where you I've on the whole not use mathematics myself, and I've done verbal argu arguments, 
And so I ought to be agreeing with you about this. But there are times when I have to say um, a verbal argument simply isn't enough. You've got to actually do the sums.